Hello there friends and welcome for today's BG guide we have at long last a new monk and this time you'll be going with a way of the four elements elemental bender monk for style and power of course this way you get to combine the most powerful monk features like flurry of blows for loads of unarmed powerful attacks with your elemental like powers, especially the one I like to call the Flying Fire Fist, which lets you burn and attack and punch the enemies from range, with higher damage than your normal punches, even. The damage can of course be quite good even early by virtue of how stacked Monk is as a class, but our Fire Fist will just make it even better, especially as you can spam and stack it with your extra attacks. All footage you see here is on honor mode, but on Tactician and below, you'll of course get higher damage and more attacks per turn. But we have more than enough, regardless. So without further ado, let us get into our Elemental Bender Monk build first with character creation. When it comes to race, anything goes as usual, but my preferred pick is the classic Half-Elf and Wood Half-Elf. This way you have higher movement, great for any melee character, and also shield proficiency for free, which does have synergy with Monk, by the way, as shields won't really prevent you from activating any of your ability, it's pretty much an upgrade for passives and more armor class. Now, as far as your stats, you actually need a lot of them, strength, dexterity, constitution, and wisdom, so what you can do is first, assign a plus two to wisdom and start with 17. Then a plus one to dexterity for 16 at character creation for higher AC and especially initiative. If you have low initiative, enemies will always act before you, which, well, puts you at a huge tactical disadvantage, especially on honor and tactician. Then 14, or more likely 15 constitution, because we'll get a feat to increase this later. And that's pretty much it. And that's pretty much it. As far as strength, which will be your main stat for damage and attack rolls starting from level 4, you can just rely on the elixirs of giant strength. And look, they are the easiest elixirs to acquire in this game. As a matter of fact, as early as the beginning of the game you can buy them in multiples from Aunt Ethel at the Druid Grove, and around level 4, which is when you need them, the merchant at the Myconid colony will always have one for sale per long rest, and guess what? The elixir itself lasts until long rest, so you'll never ever run out. It's definitely quite efficient and worthwhile. Plus she's right next to a teleporter, <laughs> it's fast as well. As far as the skills and background, it doesn't really matter much for this type of character, but either acrobatics or athletics, because you have high strength and dexterity, you can also get insight from a background like Yield Artisan, and whatever else you want. The second level is just monk abilities, but even higher, movement speed when unarmored while patient defense can help you tank early. Level 3, however, is when we finally get to enter into our Elemental Bender subclass, Way of the Four Elements. It might not be the best of the monk subclasses like Way of the Open Hand, but it is still quite efficient and viable. You have two unique abilities first, Harmony of Fire and Water is once per long rest and can restore half of your key points per use. Great, because the more key points, the more you can spam your elemental abilities and also flurry of blows for duo attacks. Now you also get to pick your special bender spells. I'll be blunt, the best one by far is Fangs of the Fire Snake. First, this actually deals base damage equal to your unarmed punch damage, plus modifiers from gear and so on. Some sources of extra damage are even applied twice on top, like Fowler Aluve Shriek as Thunder Damage and Kalos Glow Ring, even on Honor Mode. So the damage will always be decent, except it's also boosted by 1d10 fire, quite respectable, and, as if all that was not enough, it also increases the damage of all of your next attacks after this one, with 1d4 fire damage, for one whole turn. Plus, it even lets you attack from 6 meters away, which is why I call this the Flying Fire Fist, kinda like a ranged punch. Also, it only costs a single key point, so quite spammable. Lastly, it will stack with extra attacks, meaning you can fire two fangs of the Fire Snake per action, 
Less on honor mode, of course, due to the action economy nerf. But still plenty. Overall, I can't really think of any situation where you don't wanna just spam this for your normal actions and flurry of blows for the bonus actions. What this means is the other disciple of the element skills are kind of there just if you want them, for style, for flavor, for utility perhaps. Something like Rush of Gale Spirits can help, as the range itself is rather good, a big line in front of you that's also wide enough, can push enemies back and force them off balance for advantage on attacks against them. It's just that, well, it costs two key points, so costly, and the enemies can resist this. The same for Fist of Four Thunders, which is essentially the same as the level 1 Thunder Wave spell, except it has much shorter area of effect than Rush of the Gale Spirit, so I'd rather pick that instead. Something like Water Whip can bring enemies close to you, but you have range with Fire Snake anyways. And you can also use Blade of Rhyme, which is the equivalent of the Ice Knife spell, so can hit multiple enemies, but they can save against it. Gold damage can be doubled if the enemies are wet, however. Even shaping of the ice to create an ice cube, but... Like I said, this is just thanks of the Fire Snake. Pick whatever you want for flavor, so you can be a multi-elemental bender, like fire, wind, and whatever you want, really. Level 4 is huge for any monk, because through a feat, we can finally pick one of the best talents in the game. Tavern Brawler, as always, also increases your constitution to 16, for nice enough hit points, and well, essentially, you can add now double your strength modifier to both attack rolls and damage. This feat is just super good. Once again, you can simply rely on the ever so available elixirs of giant strength. Level 5 means an extra attack, great because it works with both your normal punches and fangs of fire snake. Now, starting from level 6, you can either remain a pure elemental bender monk, which I don't think is that strong. Or you can multiclass, something I find way more efficient and effective. Anyways, if you remain a pure disciple of the four elements, you will get access to some new spells, it's just that they aren't really good enough to justify a pure class progression. For example, Clench of the North Wind is essentially Hold Person, but worse, you can just use Scrolls of it, while Embrace of the Inferno is the same as Scorching Ray, they aren't really worth it. Other bonuses later are increasing the power of some of your Way of the Element spells, but not the great ones like Fangs of Fire Snake, so I wouldn't bother. Even at level 11 you get new spells, but once again, they are not good enough. My preferred pick is to get started into multiclassing now, first with the classic Rogue. This way at level 8 we can enter the Thief subclass, for one extra bonus action per turn, which of course translates into an extra flurry of blows, that is, two extra attacks per turn, what's not to love. After that, it's time to multiclass into the classic fighter. Sadly, your fighting style pick doesn't really matter, besides defense, if you want to wear armor. As I said, you still have all of your offensive abilities when armored. I suppose protection can also work, if you're going with shields. But anyways, the main benefits of multiclassing into Fighter, as always, are Action Surge at the second level, and this does still let you get an extra attack, even in honor mode, so that's dual attacks of course, just like Flurry of Blows, even more Fangs of the Fire Snake if you want. And level 3 Fighter for the Champion subclass for higher critical range, as at this point, Act 3, you are swimming in critical boosting gear and it all stacks. You might as well remain fighter for 4 levels at level 12, so you can finally get an extra feat and well, either pick ability improvement and max your wisdom out, or alert, it's just that at this point in the game you have extra gear that increases initiative instead, so I'd rather get wisdom. One of the boots you have at act 3 will increase your damage based on wisdom after all. Now let us cover gear for our Elemental Bender Way of the Elements Monk. For the helmet, during Act 1 you absolutely want the Haste Helm, as higher movement speed is always welcome for any melee build. And honestly, you might as well keep to it during the second chapter, but if you multiclass with Fighter earlier, you can also go with Dark Justice your helmet. Sadly, I don't believe the Diadem of Arcane Synergy works with this type of monk, as far as I've tested, 
I suppose even if we have a few spell-like abilities, Monk isn't really classified as a spellcasting class, so I wasn't really able to get this to proc, sadly, despite our high wisdom. Maybe if you get like one level into Druid or something like that. Then for Act 3, either Saravox Helmet for higher critical range, or the Horns of the Berserker for higher unarmed damage. It's up to you what you prefer. Cloaks don't matter, go with whatever you want, including the Cloak of Displacement for some extra defenses. For armor, as I said, monks can actually equip armor, while still retaining the use of all their most powerful offensive abilities. If you want to be a more classic unarmored monk, well, it's just that there aren't any special monk robes in this game, unfortunately. I'm not sure why, but unlike, let's say, Neverwinter Nights, where you can find loads of monk robes, they just don't exist in BG3. At most, you'll get something like the Vest of Soul Rejuvenation during Act 3 only, but at this point, you might as well just go with Hell Dusk Armor for huge AC increases, as it doesn't require heavy armor proficiency. Earlier, you can of course go with either light or medium armor if you want, depending on your multi-classing combinations. If you go with half elf or human, you'll have light armor even as a monk. Later, as a fighter, you also have medium armor proficiency. For gloves, sadly, growling underdog doesn't seem to work with unarmed attacks. So for Act One, you might as well keep to the gloves of dexterity. And yes, once you find these gloves, you can dump your dexterity, respect, and put the points into something else. It's just that later, starting from the second act, you'll want to replace them, so having high dexterity at character creation helps. During the second chapter, Flawed Hell Dusk is my preferred pick because of bonus, unarmed damage. Meanwhile, Act 3 means, of course, the gloves of soul catching for the highest boost to unarmed damage possible. For boots, they actually don't matter much until Act 3, but earlier on you can just go with the classic Disintegrating Nightwalkers for Misty Step for free. It's just that as a bonus action, it kinda clashes with your flurry of blows, but sometimes it helps to teleport away from enemies. Especially on Iron Man Honor Mode. The evasive shoes also work. For Act 3, however, it's all about the boots of uninhibited Kushigo, so you can add your Wisdom modifier to unarmed damage per strike. For amulets, early on don't bother with Broodmother's Revenge, because it only works on weapons, and unarmed attacks aren't really treated as weapons amusingly enough. I would just go for the amulet of Missy Step. Then for Chapter 2, the Surgeon's Subjugation Amulet should paralyze enemies on criticals. Amazing when combined with the Luck of the Far Realms, Mind Flayer power followed by the Amulet of Greater Health during Act 3. For Rings, don't bother with stuff like Caustic Band, because it's the same as Broodmother's Revenge, won't work on Unarmed. So just settle for Crusher's Ring for higher movement speed early. Later, during the second chapter, you absolutely want Risky Ring for advantage on all attacks, of course. When you combine this with Tavern Brawler, you are never missing, ever. Followed by Kellos Glow Ring, because it is one of the very few extra damage sources that works with Unarmed. The same for spells. For weapons, well, monks can actually use weapons if you want. As a matter of fact, this character can actually equip the Knife of the Undermountain King as early as Act 1 just fine, because your flurry of blows will still come as unarmed attacks, despite weapon and shield, and the same is true for your Fangs of the Fire Snake because it's also unarmed damage for free. The only downside is when attacking normally with your actions, you won't be punching, you'll be slicing at the enemy, but like I said, you can replace attacks for Fangs of the Fire Snake if you prefer. And yes, you can later dual wield the Blade of Blood Thirst as well for dual critical range increases. Speaking about higher criticals, for Act 3 just go with either the Dead Shot, Longbow, or Hell Rider for plus 3 to initiative, and for the first and second chapters, the Bow of Awareness for plus one to initiative. You don't really have to attack with these weapons, it's just for the passives. And as far as consumables, as I said before, it's all about first Hill Giant for Act 1 and 2 and later during Act 3, but even the second chapter as well, the Cloud Giant Elixir instead. Both will increase your strength to enormous amounts and are easily acquirable and farmable and craftable. Just like I explained in my best honor mode party guide, if you have a transmuter wizard at your campsite, you can craft double elixirs per resource spent. 
Well, all right, friends, so this was it for my Elemental Bender Monk build and guide. If you found it useful, as always, please remember to like, subscribe, and also consider becoming a channel member if you can. I truly appreciate your support. Thank you for watching, and see you next time, friends.